Good morning, everybody. My name is Marek Ranis, and uh, with Janet Williams, we are a uh, host of our weekly Friday artist lecture series at the College of Arts and Architecture, Department of Art and Art History. Uh, today, we have a special treat because uh, we're actually going to also have a, a visiting host, Adam Justice, director of, of our galleries, who will uh, talk to our visiting artist uh, who's also showing right now in the Rogue Gallery. So since we are now switching to more in-person activities, this is kind of the first time when we actually have an artist and uh, show in the same time. So Adam, welcome to our lecture series. Hey, thank you, Merrick. Hey, everybody. We are coming at you live from Row Arts. And for those of you who haven't been here in a while, it is still here. And it's looking forward to welcoming you back and getting your creative energy back in the building. Uh, thanks for joining us today. We are joined by artist Kristen Rowell today, who's a Charlotte-based artist. And she currently has an exhibition and an installation in Upper Row Galleries. Get my hand out of the way there. And so we will be first, um, we'll kind of do a, a brief walkthrough of the exhibition and let Kristen kind of introduce you to her work and to the show. And then we'll go back to an office and we can then um, look through some of the questions that you all sent. Thank you, by the way, some really great, great questions. Um, and then we'll look through those questions and we'll kind of have a conversation about her work based on the questions that you all gave us. So I'm gonna flip my camera around here and welcome Kristen. Hey everybody, <laughs> um, it's good to talk to you through the phone. Um, so this is my show, Ruin and Restoration that I was able to put up here, thankfully. Um, so we can just walk on through. So I'm gonna read a poem first that I wrote to kind of go along with the show. Um, the final rock falls, the dust settles, and the light begins to shine again. In the stillness, a tiny vine begins to move, in and out, growing and twisting, bursting from its hiding place. It dances over the rubble, through the cracks and into the light. Using each rock as a stepping stone, it grasps the sky, winding and struggling, never surrendering as it reaches for restoration in the ruin. Um, so that's a poem that I went to go along with the show. So you can come on um, So the work in here I created over the past couple of months. Um, I have some drawings that are older that kind of started this whole process um, of the motif of the tendrils that I have going through the work. Um, so this is the main piece is my installation, which is titled Ruin and Restoration. Um, and I just wanted, in a lot of my work, I use materials that people see often, and in Charlotte, we're always seeing changing buildings, um, reconstruction and deconstruction. So I wanted to keep exploring using cinder blocks and messing around with them with sand and then incorporating uh, weird fabric tendrils to go along with it. Um, and with this installation, I also have these three paintings that work together kind of as a triptych. Um, I guess when I, what I want to say is like my idea of this work with everything that we've been going through with COVID, things changing, um, our country how it is right now, there's a lot of emphasis on mental health and struggling, trying to make sense of the world. And so you're going to see a lot of tendrils in the work. And my idea is kind of like how we're all growing and learning and the tendrils and these paintings and these drawings on the other side, they're all kind of going through these different actions. Like this drawing is called Hiding Place. And I kind of want the viewer to think about where you go when you're stressed out, like what is your hiding place? So I want the tendril to kind of be like who 
you are on the inside, if that makes sense. Sure. Um, and this one is called upheaval. You know, I think of, of the drawings, this one um, especially kind of represents the combination of, you know, the, the cinder block installation yeah. um, and like the solid identity that has and kind of the softness of the charcoal of the drawings. Mm -hmm. um, but. This one is burst forth. So the, the tendrils, they they kind of represent growth. Yes. But they can also represent, you know, growth as the individual. So they, they are the kind of a, um, a form that is supposed to be the person. And as it gets longer, it grows and tangles and knots. Yeah. It's kind of adapting and growing according to all of the environmental variables that yeah. it has around it. And it can definitely, like I want, like the poem and the sculpture, and some of these drawings are hopeful, but then there's different stages of like stress and anxiety and fear. Uh, so yeah, I'm trying to explore how to like convey those ideas in like abstract, not representation form. Yeah. What um, about this one? So this one is called the Cascade of Healing, and it's definitely the most different from the rest of the works. Um, I'm gonna read something to you guys. <laughs> so this scientific definition of the cascade of healing, when the skin is injured, our body sets into motion an automatic series of events often referred to as the cascade of healing. In order to repair the injured tissues, the cascade of healing is divided into these four overlapping phases, hemostasis, inflammatory, proliferative, and maturation. I'll speak up just a little bit. Oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> you want me to read that again? Sure. Okay. Yeah. Um, so the cascade of healing. When the skin is injured, our body sets into motion an automatic series of events, often referred to as the cascade of healing. In order to repair the injured tissues, the cascade of healing is divided into these four overlapping phases. Hemostasis, inflammatory, proliferative, and maturation. So with this piece, I, I felt like, you know, the red, very bright red is kind of like the initial wound. And then this is like, this texture is kind of like the scarring uh, once your wound is healed and still exploring the idea of what it's like to heal, what it means to heal, um, all the different stressful phases of healing. So, and and speak a little bit. Um, so we'll we'll look at the label for this here, and you'll notice that it's you know there's a lot of different media in there: sand, acrylic paint, tin foil. So so how did you develop this process with all of these materials? Um, I I like I guess sculpture is probably my favorite. <laughs> and so I've been trying, but I also love painting and drawing. And so I've been trying to figure out how to incorporate. 3D materials into painting. So I was messing around one day and I was like, what materials do I have in my house that I can try? So I used tin foil and I really liked once it dried, I like splatter a bunch of gesso onto the panel and then I layer the tin foil. So that's how it gets the like bigger um, bumps. And then pouring sand, I've always incorporated sand into my sculptures. I feel like it's a good way to represent uh, time. And then if you use cinder blocks, that can just represent the dust that comes from the blocks or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and it's nice too, because I can be a bit more rough with it. I always use wooden panels so that I can like mm -hmm. be aggressive. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, and then these three paintings, um, this one is titled Weaving Through. And somebody pointed out to me that it kind of looks like a figure a little bit, like with the head up there and shoulders. Mm, yeah, yeah. Which I didn't intend, but I'm totally cool with that. <laughs> well, it's funny how those things start to kind of yeah. creep out, yeah. you know, sometimes. Um, because I kind of want it, 
the idea of like weaving through making sense of um the world and like our place in it and sort of the meditative aspect of that um this one is mind over matter and so it's gesso and charcoal and then i made a rectangle of sand and painted into that And then this one is critical mass. This was the first work I did and I battled with it for a while. But um, yeah, just the same, a bunch of the same materials of paint, sand, pastels. This one has some paper in it and tin foil. Yeah, there are some collage elements in here with the paper. Tin foil. Okay, and then the last. And this one is I pieced together my reflection and breathe deeply, and so I don't know if you is are people going to be able to come and see the work. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think we we started um, students started coming back this week, okay. so if you all are in Row Arts, this will be up until the middle of March, so you can definitely come up and, and check it out. Um, but I. I'm hoping people will look at their reflection in the mylar. Um, and I guess this one is kind of like um, what it's like trying to make sense of who you are and the distortion and how you perceive yourself, how you perceive others how others perceive you and just trying to find a way to be okay with that <laughs> and find calmness in the chaos and you know kind of you know speaking of chaos i mean it, it <laughs> seems like you know that that's certainly an element in a lot of your installation work mm -hmm. because you do use a lot of um you know materials that would normally be disposed of after construction or deconstruction yeah. so a lot of cinder blocks a lot of dust a lot of fragments of things uh plywood metal pieces um but then you also go back into them um and you add this kind of soft element mm -hmm. that is a really great contrast i think to you know just it was it was interesting to watch you install this because you know you started with the cinder blocks and it was like this really heavy brute harsh Insulation, but then you came in with these soft sewn like you know lilac colored tendrils mm -hmm. and you kind of put them throughout the piece and it really kind of adds this. I mean, going back to the painting you're talking about the scars and the bruising it adds this kind of broken skin yeah. to this really hard underlayer almost mm -hmm. and I think it really works it's really beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, but. But I think that's kind of a new, it seems to me that like that's kind of a new element for your installations. I mean, a lot of your work in the past, it was, I mean, you don't, you're very postmodern in terms of you, you don't try to hide the materials you're using. You want the materials and the identity of the materials to be a big part of the installation. Mm -hmm. um, but with this one, you're doing that still, but you're also adding this other layer of kind of softness and kind of these really gentle curved forms. Yeah. Um, and so what what kind of made you arrive at that point? Why did why did you want to add, you know, this kind of soft element to this this installation where you really hadn't done that a lot before? Yeah. Um, I think with this piece, it was kind of like again thinking about like changing and shifting and the fabric immediately, like you can move it around so mm. easily, mm -hmm. and. Um, I was trying to decide how I wanted to convey like growth. Mm -hmm. um, and so like vines and tendrils, things that you see like when a house is broken down, then the vines take over. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of why I started to introduce that. And I'm trying to move a little bit more towards, I'm, in my past work, it was pretty harsh and um, maybe a little depressing. Some of my work's kind of depressing. <laughs> So I'm trying to have a more hopeful uh, view because yeah. I think the words can be depressing. Sure. So. <laughs> sure. But I mean, after this past year, I mean, yeah. also, I think that ironically, there's been a, a, a big growth of optimism, right? Yes. And so that definitely shows up in this piece. And also, you know, you, you spoke when you're talking about the drawings, how the tendril 
represents personal growth yeah. and the, the human growth in relation to its environment around it. And, you know, I think this is a really great three-dimensional uh, representation of that because you do have this kind of harsh environment, but you have these tendrils that represent growth that are kind of weaving in and out of this harsh environment. And, you know, no matter how heavy the environment is, it's not stopping the growth. Yeah. Uh, kind of like, you know, what you said, the vine. I mean, you know, these vines can like, you know, they can actually break bricks apart when, yeah. when they grow between them. Yeah. And so the power of these small, almost kind of delicate tendrils and how they can persevere yes. and grow and break apart this harsh environment in order to, to live on. Um, I think it's a, a really successful um, installation of, of that, that mm -hmm. idea. Yeah. Yeah. And it was, it was interesting to making this work because I was making everything in like a small smaller amount of time and I was I don't have access to the studio right now so it was like I was constantly thinking about how everything relates because everything was so close to each other mm -hmm. all the time yeah <laughs> and I but I feel like that actually kind of helped me make a very cohesive body of work that kind of has this um I don't know makes an environment that you can like walk through and think about and the poem that goes along with it mm -hmm. they all kind of work towards that same idea of mm -hmm. growth and yeah. Restoration. Yeah. Cool. Well, I think um, I think that's a really good overview and a walk through the gallery. So let's go back to the office and we can kind of look at some of the questions okay. and we can we can start that. And and maybe um, what we'll do is we'll start. Hold on. Oops, sorry. Getting all my cameras mixed up. We'll start by um, maybe just asking you to talk a little bit about you know, your background as an artist and as a student. And then we, we can look through the questions. Good. Yeah, that's good. Okay. And I'll load them up on my computer too. I did see we had a few, we had one question come in while we were in the gallery. Um, Natalie asks, well, Natalie says she'll be in row later today and will she be able to see it in person? Yeah, it'll be, it'll be open, Natalie. Um, it'll be open until four. So I hope you can, you can come by before then, but definitely pop in and see it. Yes, please come. <laughs> okay. So, so a little bit about your background, um, as, as an artist, as a student, you know, where you went to school, what you studied and kind of what you're doing now. Okay. Um, so I went to Winthrop University in Rock Hill, South Carolina. Um, I originally went in for interior design, and then they told me everything was going to be on the computer, and I said no. <laughs> <laughs> and so I went in, and I was going to just fully major in painting, because that's what I liked to do when I was younger. And then I took a sculpture class, and I really liked how... Um, sculpture is so tangible and you can walk around it and interact with it if you want um and so i decided i have a major in sculpture and painting um and so then after that i took let's see what did i do <laughs> I, okay i saved up some money and i went to italy and i um, sculpted some marble there for three months. Um, Where was, in Italy did you go? Uh, it was in, it's a little town called Quercetta, but okay. it's kind of like on the, it's in the Tuscany region. Okay. So okay. you were there for how long? Three months. So you went to Italy to study, specifically to study how to carve marble? Yes. In Italy. How did you learn about that opportunity? How did you I had that? studied abroad okay. and I in Florence, Italy, my junior year, and I decided I saw that I could take marble carving in Italy, and I was like, oh my god, I have to do that. So the instructor there, he owned or co-owned this um, studio in Quarcetta, Italy, which is like an hour and a half outside of Florence, and they there's like a group of people that live there full time, and they sculpt marble, and then they keep it open where you can come in and rent a studio if you want. Um, and so I was like, okay, I'm gonna like get to know this instructor and do a good job in the class because I went and visited the studio and it was really cool. And I was like, I really wanna come back here. So when I didn't know what I was gonna do once I graduated, 
I emailed him and asked if I could come. And he said, yes. So I just saved up some money and went over there and it was awesome to meet a bunch of artists that like, all they do is sculpt marble all the time. So there's like so much information and like knowledge that you can learn. Um, so I did that for three months and then I came to Charlotte and I started working at Central Piedmont Community College as their visual arts coordinator. So I like take care of the studios, monitor students. Um, yeah, and so I also like work, I like to work for other artists too, because that's a great way to learn about being an artist. So um, I worked for a couple artists and then I also help out at the McCall Center, um, also being a studio manager there. Because in, in college, I was a woodshop monitor and then I worked for my sculpture professor, um, Sean Cassidy, who sculpts steel. So I learned how to take care of studios through that and how to uh, manage things and be safe and all that. Nice. So, yeah. so, so how, how do you, how did, I mean, I'm sure your experience in Italy and, and learning how to carve marble, I'm, I'm sure that had some kind of impact on your work before and after. How do you, are you, are you conscious of how that may have informed your work um, after you had that experience? I think I kind of look at, when I went there, I was freaking out because I was like, oh my God, I've traveled to Italy to sculpt marble. I don't know how to sculpt marble really. What am I doing? And so I had to just keep my mind open and just make work and not let myself get all caught up in like the, the thought process behind it. So I think that that has affected me in the sense of kind of, it's lessened my fear a little bit. I mean, I still get nervous when I'm making work, but that helped a lot. Um, I kind of learned, so I love the action of sculpting marble because it's kind of like it turns into your child because you're saying you're like, you can't make any hit without losing that piece of stone forever. Um, and then you have to sand it forever to get it like perfectly smooth. And so you work on this one piece for a really long time. And it's very gratifying when you're done because you're like, I just worked on this piece for 20 hours and I love it. And but also, so I love that aspect of it, but I also don't like that aspect because sometimes I just want to like smash up cinder blocks and make an installation and I don't want to take a crazy amount of time to work on one piece. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I love both ways of working, mm -hmm. but it kind of showed me where I want to go. Cool. And what I want to do. That was a really valuable experience. I mean, it was. It's great that you did that. Yeah. I hope to go back maybe because there's like a great community of people where because the town is right outside of Carrara so there's hundreds and hundreds of marble sculptors in that area and it's just a great place to meet people from all over the world um, who like sculpture. Yes. <laughs> so, awesome. yeah, cool. well, let's get to some questions from students. Did you right. have some in particular that you? There were so many good ones. Yeah there were um, a lot of good ones. So this first one, in your artist biography and statement, you stated that you enjoy prompting the viewer to think about their own personal experience with your 2D and 3D creations. Where does your personal experience come from in your artwork? If it doesn't, then what is your process of creating these works and who are you influenced by? Um, it's a good question. It is a good question. So. I think whenever I go in to make sculpture and painting, I think of like certain buzzwords that I want to explore. Um, and normally when I go into my work, I, I like to explore instability, fragility, insecurity, um, anxiety. And a lot of the things that I think about <laughs> is like, I can be a pretty anxious person and kind of learning how to grow and become more confident. So I explore those things in my work. And um, I think taking a stone and breaking it, people you know, see cinder blocks all the time, but if you do an action onto a material, people will think about brokenness or 
if something's balancing on something, they'll think about balance and sand can show time, things like that. So I like to use these actions to maybe kind of guide the viewer to think about a certain emotion. Mm -hmm. um, but who am, who am I influenced by? A lot of it is like talking to friends and family and just people's life experiences and trying to like connect humans with our human experience. Everybody goes through stuff and how do I convey that in some kind of way? Um, yeah. And then who are my biggest influences? There's so many. <laughs> But I think probably uh, I, I love Anselm Kiefer's work. Um, he's an artist from Germany. Mm -hmm. And with his paintings, he does this crazy layering of paint. He'll like leave it outside. He'll go in and have a um, palette knife and just like hit it, take paint away, and he kind of lets that time aspect go into his work. And he does a lot of layering. And then with his sculptures, he uses. Um, he has some material that is kind of construction worthy. He, he has this studio in France, I think, where you can go and it's basically like this whole art experience. And he has these towers of these big concrete boxes and things like that. So I really like how you can walk in and out of his studio. I've never been there, but <laughs> I hope to go someday. But I like how you can walk around and like see all this work that he's constantly creating. Um, I also love Julie May Raitu, mm -hmm. who's a painter, and she has a show in Atlanta that I actually think is still up, and yeah. I've just gotten taken down, but she does these beautiful paintings and layers, uh, line drawing. Really complicated, really complex. Super complex. I, yeah. I went there in person. I've never seen her work in person, um, and I saw it about two months ago, and I was just like mind blown because they're ginormous pieces i know she has a lot of people working for her but it is just like so impressive um those are two very different yeah <laughs> i mean you know you you've got the you know the kind of dark moody cerebral kind of heavy pieces of kefir mm -hmm. but then you have you know the very intricate and complex mm -hmm. two-dimensional pieces by marutu yeah um that's that's an interesting connection to make, mm -hmm. and you know I can I can you know looking at your work I can see a little bit of you know your interest in both of those, right. but um, I, I would certainly had had picked Kiefer as maybe someone you were really influenced by, but that's that's an interesting kind of yeah I definitely I mean I feel like I think I love like the power of Julie Mayberry's work is just it's so impressive. Um, but yeah, it's, it's very different, but yeah. yeah. That's great. Um, let's see. There's a good one here that, I mean, it kind of references, well, it does directly reference the, the link that you sent about the 11 things that scare creative artists, oh, yeah. which I thought was a great list. I've never seen that before. Um, but Matt asked, he, he said he enjoyed it, but he asks, um, what, what of those fears do you think most relate to you in your um, process? Definitely the, I think the first one is fear of failure. Mm -hmm. And I, I know just about everybody's scared of failure, but I feel like as an artist, it's kind of, and the other one is um, fear of putting out work that isn't perfect. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, it's kind of irrational to think that your artwork can be perfect and cannot be perfect because I think it's art and it's like something that you create and in that way, it's good. <laughs> like, yeah. Uh, yeah. But I definitely, um, there's a lot of vulnerability that comes with being an artist and mm -hmm. being like, this is something that I created that came out of my brain. Mm -hmm. I hope that you like it. <laughs> mm -hmm. And like, people won't like it, people will like it. Um, but definitely if you're a failure and like, having work that's not perfect yeah uh those those two scared me the most but it's it also is just like there's nothing i can do about it. well right i mean i think it's important and it, it comes with experience but it one of the hard lessons is to just realize and be comfortable with the fact that your work is going to be open to interpretation for everybody yeah. Yeah. and you can't control that mm -hmm. i mean you you can only i mean i guess kind of a um 
you know, the bar of success as an artist would be, does this work fully represent communicate what your intent was yeah. as the artist? And then you had to like, kind of let it go. Yeah. Um, and that can be really difficult. So, yeah. so how have you found kind of getting, I mean, not to say that you're completely over those hurdles. I don't mm -hmm. think, you know, any artist is completely over mm -hmm. any of that, but what makes it easier for you to, to kind of get past that fear at least temporarily with a piece and mm -hmm. and uh but it be um i think i tell myself i make sure that i'm i'm making the work as authentically as i can uh -huh. and and then it's like you can always keep working on work but once you get to that point where you're like i am content with this i might kind of like hate it a little bit but <laughs> i'm like content with the work that's when i'm like okay it's good to let it go and I just try to make sure that um the work in some aspect expresses what I'm trying to say and then I wrote the poem hmm. to kind of help guide the viewer even more especially with this abstract work with the tendrils it's pretty easy for uh like my dad came and saw it and he was like I like the tendrils. I don't really get them, but I like them. <laughs> and so I feel like with abstract work, especially, it's yeah. good to have something to kind of help guide a little bit. Sure. And yeah. then just be like, okay. Yeah, abstract like, needs context, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, you know, there are people that are going to reply to it aesthetically in terms they like the form or the color, it. but but it, it does need a little more context. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Okay, another question? Um, so this one, how do you decide which material you want to use to convey a certain idea or mood for the viewer? Mm -hmm. um, I talked a little bit about that, like, if you see a stone that's broken, it makes you think of brokenness. And so a lot of times, I mean, I have certain materials that I like to work with. Like, I really do love working with cinder blocks. The question above it says, how do you feel your work represents the community around, uh, represents the community around the found natural elements in your work? Um, and I feel like with cinder blocks, it's something that everybody sees all the time. Um, you can immediately relate to it. And so I like, I gravitate towards stone, cinder blocks, harder materials that you can create an action on. And like we were talking about in the installation with the soft fabric, I think if you have something that's really hard and then really soft, people will, will notice that difference and kind of think about how they relate to each other. And even with color, stuff like that. Um, yeah. There's something else I was gonna say, but I left my brain. <laughs> So there's a there's a great I mean speaking of installation your installation there's a great question from Nicole um, who she she does says that she she loves your sculpture piece persist okay. um, and she's wondering with big site specific pieces do you first have an idea and then approach the space or does the space inform the the piece I mean with site specific you do have that that space you have to contend with you yeah. have to keep it in mind sure. um, but do you start with the idea of how you want an installation to look and then you tailor it to the space mm -hmm. or do you you first look at the space get a feel for it and then mm -hmm. approach it from that normally I already have an idea of what I want to make and then when I go in and see the space I'm like okay I know how to utilize the space like with that piece persist um and I, I think everybody looked at my website but it's these ladders that go up and through this window through a wall and curve up to the ceiling uh in the gallery with that piece i had already something that i really like to do when i'm making sculpture is i make a bunch of things and then play with them basically so with the ladders i made a whole bunch of wooden ladders and then Play with them kind of like blocks and see interesting ways that I can move them around. So I'm going to show a picture of it here. So this is, I hope you all can see this. It's just on my laptop, but this is Persist. So she has these ladders that she's built in the space. It goes up through the wall. It's pretty, pretty great. Um, 
And so I had actually applied, I had made a uh, proposal for that sculpture. And my initial idea was to go just to have them scaling up the wall in a straight line. And then when it got accepted, I was looking at it and I was like, I can make it go through that window. <laughs> and so I just kind of went along with it. And a lot of times it's kind of like staying open when you go into a space and thinking of how you can make everything work and be interesting. And how, then, how did you approach the ruin and restoration installation? With this one, I already knew I wanted to do some kind of weird cinder block um, sculpture. And when I got into the space, I really like the idea of having something kind of just like centered that people can walk around. And I also, I haven't been painting very much. And so I really wanted to make some 2D work. And so that's how I kind of, I was like, you know what, something right in the middle would be good. And also the idea of like um, a house, something very rectangular. Um, that's kind of why I went with that very uh, singular shape. Um, yeah, I think, didn't you, uh, you came and looked at the space and then you went back, you know, into your shed in the backyard and like taped out the footprint yes, of did. the space? I, I went and I, I measured it here and I was like, okay, 14 feet by seven feet or something. <laughs> and then at my house, we have, we lucked out and there's this like warehouse shed thing in the back. And I just like, taped the length and I was like okay and brought all the cinder blocks in there and it's really weird like making work not in the space because you're just like I'm trying to understand how small things will seem when they're in the gallery because right now it seems really big because I'm in a shed <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but yeah that's that's a fun thing about installation um let's see So this one, somebody said, Anna said, I am taking stone carving. What would be your advice as to where to start? Mm -hmm. um, I would, I don't know, Anna, if you can choose your stone material, like what kind of stone you're using, but I would use alabaster if you can, because it's super soft and you can, with alabaster, you can take a rasp and you can just like shave it basically because of how soft it is. Um, and the nice thing about that is you can kind of figure out what kind of forms you want to make pretty fast. And since it's so um, soft, it's not going to take you forever. And then when you move into it, uh, I would, I mean, how I make my work is I kind of think about like a image that I want to create. Um, and then I just start hitting it and taking chunks off and moving very like intuitively with the piece. Um, and then once you get a little bit better with understanding the stone, you can start to like draw things out and measure things out and using calipers and stuff like that. That's my, my recommendation. That's a good <laughs> um, let's see. So this, Callie said, how do you go about titling your work? I um, saw that and I thought about asking, but <laughs> I know that can be really difficult. Well, normally I was actually really surprised because normally, especially when I make my sculptures um, or like big paintings as I'm creating them, I think of these titles and it's like something that just happens. But then with this whole show, I was like, oh my God, I don't know what to title anything. Um, but a lot of times when I'm thinking about what I want to title stuff, I think about those buzzwords that I was talking about. Um, so like when I was making these paintings in my room, I had this, I have this like tarp taped up to my wall and I just wrote down a bunch of these words that I kind of want to explore. And of course, I think I told myself to take a picture of them to read off and then I didn't, but um, like one of the final drawings I have is titled recuperation. And that was one of the words of like growth and recuperation. So I kind of go through and think about what the work is about. And then I find these words. I also use, I look up synonyms for things all the time. Uh, the one about 
um, the cascade of healing that was left in, because I found that definition, I was like, that's perfect, that book. But I also will like, research things involving um, mental health, stuff like that, and look up different scientific things. So. I, I think this is an interesting question because it could really kind of spiral into a bigger conversation. But Emmett asks, um, does the area of Beaufort influence the way you create? Because, I mean, you know, so much of your work is found objects that we see every day. Mm -hmm. So that that means that you've somehow over time been sensitive to those materials and seeing those materials and how they've been used or how they've been disposed of mm -hmm. and what they, you know, when you look at them, you see something different in okay. them. I mean, did that kind of start as growing up right. in, in yeah. Buford or is that something that kind of developed, you know, later when you were experimenting with the materials itself? It's definitely something that developed later. I would say that growing up in Buford, I was always running around outside and like there's a lot of marshland and sand and like uh, natural landscape and so I was always out there playing and so I think that that kind of made me sensitive to like materiality which is really important and like how things feel how they look I think coming up here and especially being in Charlotte I had been using the cinder blocks before moving Charlotte but being up here I think the drastic difference between Buford and Charlotte kind of makes me notice the cinder blocks, all the rebar, everything changing all the time. Because in Buford, things don't change. <laughs> so it's kind of like, I mean, stuff is changing right now, but like as I was growing up, it was exactly the same all the time. And so I think that that makes me more sensitive to all the transition that I see in Charlotte. It's just like, it's very different from what I grew up with. And again, growing and adapting with that kind of oscillating environment around you constantly. Yeah. yeah. I think we have time maybe for one, one more question. Is there one on here that you'd like to, one more you'd like to address? Um, this one says, how do you navigate the art world? <laughs> That's uh, a big question. <laughs> well, I really cannot stress enough making good connections and like just being as open as you can and talking to people. Um, and I can get pretty nervous talking to people I don't know, but normally people are very receptive and want to talk about art. Like, especially if you're going to a show and the artist is there, they're gonna want you to ask some questions. Um, but that that has helped me a lot I've, I've worked for some artists and just doing that and doing a good job and like the job that you do you're going to meet people through them and then like if you like like I submitted to the Goodyear residency and that's how Adam saw my work and invited me to have a show here which is so kind um but yeah applying to things and being okay with not getting in but then sometimes you do get in and it's awesome um yeah that's that's what, I, that's what i do i mean it's still really hard but but it's fun too that's great i mean i think it is important just to stay open um yeah and and stay open to you know um i guess refusal and staying open to mm -hmm. You know the good and the bad mm -hmm. and just persisting and, and keep doing what you're doing yeah yeah and also saying yes to things that you might not want to say yes That's to good point. Yeah. um or like if you're trying to get some kind of job and they're like you know how to do this you can say yes i do and then you can learn how to do it and yeah. then do the job yeah. um so yeah just being open and being cool with whatever happens i guess sure well, this is this has been great. I think we're almost out of time, but um, you know, thank you for your time, and I think that's some some really good advice in there. Some really great insights for the yeah. students.